Well, there's definitely some, so many iconic ones you can think of. Um, but when I come into this apartment, I think of the times I was here, and I, then I think of the nights you've told me, like John Lennon passed out on this couch. Sat right here. <laughs> you know? Well, he didn't pass out. He came to actually wake up a bit. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> he had called me when I was moving. Up, I, I, my first apartment was downstairs in this building uh, when I first moved into West Beth, and then a few years later, we moved up to this apartment. And the weekend I was moving, John uh, called me, and, he, and Harry Nielsen was in town. And John was actually cleaning up during that period. It was about six or eight months since he had come back from L.A. Uh, but he said, well, Harry's in town. i got to go out. And he called me. He said, you know all the people in all the nightclubs, so he wanted me to come <laughs> along. And I said, well, I'll meet you over at Ashley's on 13th Street. But by the time I finished up the last prints I was making, I was, I was in the dark room when he called. Uh, and I'd gotten there. and. Whenever he went somewhere, so many people would gather around that within 20, 25 minutes they'd have to leave to go to the next place. And I had just missed him, and he went up to tracks, and I went up there, and I just missed him. And he went over to JP, so I went over there and just missed him. And I thought, I can't chase around all night. So I came home, and Sunday afternoon he called me and uh, said he was in the neighborhood and wanted to drop by. I hadn't been home yet. And I thought, wow, I missed some kind of wild weekend, <laughs> you know. Um, and I told him I had a new apartment. He should buzz when he got here. Cause it's a little complicated to find us in this crazy building. Um, and you know, the whole building's all artists, and uh, everybody is like some form of painter or poet, poet or sculptor or musician or something. And so uh, about half hour went by, and I was walking across to go to actually, I was getting ready to call the doorman and see if some English guy had shown up when John came breezing into the apartment. And the first thing he said, man, you got some weird neighbors. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I was ringing doorbells trying to find your apartment. <laughs> Everybody it's was Sunday, up. there's John Lennon. Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock, here's John Lennon at your door. And everybody's going like, oh, let me show you my paintings. Let me show you my poetry. I got a new song I just wrote here. I made this sculpture. You know, and they were all like super excited. So I'm still living that down. I'm kind of well known in the building for that. Well, still, I mean, this is a hard place to find. You have to when you come yeah. in here. I'm not going to disclose. It's like a dead end street. You have to come here on purpose. Yeah, you know? <laughs> didn't know how to get here. But you, it's a small space with so much great stuff. But I remember yeah. you having these Christmas parties, and it was like the Marx Brothers movie. I used to pack movie, a lot of people. In, like, <laughs> yeah. scene. Yeah. I remember one friend of ours like knocking into the tree. Oh, no, that's how it ended. That's yeah, it, yeah. No more. What happened we, to parties? We, we did it for like 20 years or so, and then finally it was so crowded, and at the very end, somebody pulled the tree over and it fell, and that was kind of a fitting ending. Uh, you know, because it just got too crowded, and every year it was kind of good for us because every year we would clear off all the tables and put everything, you know, stash it somewhere. And then all of a sudden that year, all the stash places were full. <laughs> like after 20 years, like all the nooks and crannies were full, and, and we just don't have space in here anymore to fill up with people. But, all right. but I have my birthday party, that's a big party, so that's coming. But yeah, it's kind of also something I noticed with you, besides just taking photos, I think you have something to give to artists. I think like if a band or, or someone like John Lennon, whoever comes to town, or if you told me a story, oh, I took the clash above Marin County in mm. Northern California up to my favorite spot in that area. I took the a Mount Tamapias, mountain. Mount Tamapias, yeah. What is it called? The Mount Tamapias. Yeah, it's, and just turn them on to this. Or, you know, I remember when Joe Strummer would come to town and, you know, he'd call you up like, what's going on? And, you know, you'd say, well, this is happening. He would it's yell called. up at the window like, hey, Bob. <laughs> 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 so, you know, that you have something else to give just besides making people look cool. I think they want you around. Then mm. they're going to relax and be like, Oh, you're one of the gang. I mean, you were blowing what the bugle on stage with the Clash. Well, yeah, I went. Um, if you missed the, <laughs> they, they were playing some shows in England before they came here. Uh, actually, there was a big show at Hammerstein uh, for it was a benefit for um, for Cambodia or something, and they did a couple of warm up gigs. So I went to Paul's house to to get a ride with him to the gig. And he was in the bathroom getting dressed, and there was a bugle on the table. And when I was a kid, they tried to give me trumpet lessons, uh, which I wanted to play like Miles Davis, and they wanted me to play like John Philip Sousa. You know? uh -huh. So it didn't really mix, and I didn't really like playing it. But I learned how to do it. And then in Boy Scouts, I could play some bugle calls. You know, it's very easy if you know how to you know, play the trumpet. And so there's a bugle on Paul's table. So I just kind of pick it up the way I do when I see a bugle, and just started playing a couple of notes. And he came running out, he goes, oh, you can play the bugle? And I was like, well, yeah. He goes, oh, man, we want somebody to open the show with a call to arms and a charge. And I said, well, I can do that, you know. Wow. So I did a few shows for them, and I played on Broadway at Bonds. It was, uh, and if you missed the beginning of the show, you did the beginning of the well, encore. Well, yeah, Bonds, when they were in New York, I was kind of busy that time. And uh, a lot of times I would miss the very beginning, and I, I ended up <laughs> opening the encore. You know, I had some business on the Lower East Side to take care of in those days. Gotcha. Well, well it's just cool to see a lot of the stuff, I think, that, I mean, that's becoming part of the history, like I was saying, museums giving it respect, you know, big galleries mm. putting up shows. 
and then a lot of stuff. I guess you were one of the first guys with a, to video people, like video on Ike and Tina and the dolls and making these movies. The very first portable videotape machine was by Sony. Uh, it was called the Sony Porta Pack. And it was actually a, a box about this big, weighed about 40 pounds, and it had a reel-to-reel. -reel. This was before they invented cassettes. You took a, a reel of tape and you threaded it through the machine. Um, and it was mono sound, and uh, it was black and white, and it didn't work very well in the dark, but at the time it was state-of-the-art because you could actually videotape something and sh show it right back on a TV, as opposed to the only other way to record something was to make a film, and then you'd have to develop the film, which is very expensive, and then get a screening room or a projector or something a few days later, or whenever later, you know, but this, uh, the porta pack, the videotape was immediate. You could videotape a show, and then right there in the dressing room, you could play it back. And, uh, I actually first started working with Ike and Tina Turner because when I met them, I asked if I could make some videotapes and they said sure and, and they really liked it a lot, especially Tina liked being able to show the Iquettes, you know, improvements in the routines while it was still fresh in their mind. Like half an hour after they did it, they were watching it and she said, you see, you move that way instead of this way. And, uh, and the band liked seeing themselves because in those days, nobody saw their show. Right. Because it was expensive, you know. Even if you were on TV, it was usually live. Like you didn't get a tape, you couldn't record any video. Right. You know? So to be able to do that uh, was great. And actually, right now we've just released. We finally edited a lot of the footage that I made with Ike and Tina Turner into a videotape called uh, Ike and Tina Turner on the Road, 1971, 72. That's different and, than the uh, one that was just out? That's the one that's just out. Yeah, it's great. And it's got like your ex wife and, uh, in there with her, like talking lady talk in the kitchen. Yeah, and, and I just chatting like up real. Tina and does some really good interviews. And Tina's cooking for the kids, and Ike's in the studio, and they're on the road. And it opens with a really nice bit of them, Tina kind of teasing Ike in the back of the limousine. And, uh, you know, what I like to say is that if What's Love Got to Do with It, the film that showed why Ike and Tina broke up, right. you know, which was for very good reasons, uh, my film shows why they were together. Uh, and what about the, the film that bands. brought you guys together? There was some film with a, an animal involved. Oh, somewhere. the pig tape. Well, you bring that up. Oh, boy. Uh, there was it's a, always a movie. That, <laughs> well, yeah, it did help. The, you know, it was a bit of pornography, but the band boys liked that a lot, and they remembered me. That's um, the guy with the... There, there was a video group in the city, uh, and there was only a few people who were making videos, so we all kind of knew each other. And Somebody lent me this tape of a girl with a pig in a barn, um, getting rather intimate right uh, let me leave it at that Casey Hines gonna come and, after uh, us yeah. and talk about this too <laughs> well, much anyway I, I had that tape with me and, and I can see the band you know they flipped out when they saw that nobody ever seen you know porn on TV like that oh. and uh, and I only had it for a week and I had to give it back I couldn't copy it or anything because there was no way to right. copy things in those days uh, but they asked me about that tape for the next couple of years. Hey, did you ever get that tape back again? Uh, that's what they remember. <laughs> it was pretty outrageous. <laughs> but then you did those Dolls movies. I remember we were back at the Coney days, like showing mm -hmm. them. You had a night of like stuff you oh, filmed yeah, at video Mag Nights. And, video party. And then, then that came out, the Dolls. Um, yeah, we finally made a really good edit called um, uh, All Dolled Up. Yeah, for a while we used to have and, bootlegs, uh, like Howie Pyro would have these, like, you know, yeah. look at this, and they'd be sitting on a hill, so young, it's like talking, doing crazy interviews, and then there was something on 14th Street, some business about, like, um, St. Valentine's Massacre, like, on the Oh, car. I made a, the Lipstick Killers video. Yeah. Um, it was actually a film, uh, where they were playing a show on Valentine's Day, and rather than make it Hearts and Flowers, like everybody expected, they made it about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Right. Uh, the famous gangster massacre in Chicago. And so the dolls dressed up as gangsters. And to introduce it, because uh, at the film where they used to show uh, newsreels and cartoons between the acts, you know. And so we made a fake newsreel, and it actually has a beauty contest from like 1928, you know. <laughs> Girls are wearing bathing suits down to their knees. and. Um, and it had a, a prison riot, I think, in it. Uh, we did a little bit on Babe Ruth, and we actually found a bit of footage of Babe Ruth. After he played baseball, he actually went to Hollywood and was in some movies. And so there was a, a piece of film we found of him in bed with a girl putting on, he was putting on lipstick. Babe Ruth, wow. Babe Ruth, yeah. So it was a really funny kind of film. I call it my art film. And then we had presented the dolls as this gang, the lipstick killers. And they're in their headquarters, and they got machine guns around. They're playing cards and drinking whiskey, and then they go out to do a job, and they put on lipstick first, and then they pick up the machine guns, and they get on my old Volkswagen, and they're going down 
uh, 14th Street all on the running boards of uh, the Volkswagen, which fell off after the shooting because <laughs> <laughs> they broke the car. But we got the shot of them coming down 14th Street, and then they come running into the Academy of Music, and the audience is watching this film, and they come running into the theater that they're sitting in, and all of a sudden the dolls came running down the aisle as if they ran out of the film, and they start shooting the audience with the same plastic machine guns. It's very and, Mel Brooks. Uh, it's very it was very saddles. funny. <laughs> it, it, it was actually really effective. I've talked to people who were in the audience, and it totally blew their mind because yeah. nobody had gone to that kind of a length to make an introduction to just really, you know, have something that exciting as an opening. Whose idea was that? Um, I don't remember exactly. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. like either me or David or somebody. Yeah. We once went to see Green Day play the biggest show that they ever played. At that what point. giant stadium? Yeah, and I was further back, and I, I could see something weird was going on stage with Mike. But oh, Mike was he kept dying, moving to the man. side, and and then I, I couldn't really see that well because you know I wasn't in the best seat. He had one of those twenty-four hour viruses where you throw up and you puke like kind of constantly, and everything. And he else was such a professional. He managed to get on stage, play the song, and then as the people were cheering, he would run over the side of the stage, puke into this big basket pull his pants off his girlfriend, pull a new pair of pants on him, and he ran out. And there's a picture of them, actually. I, I, it cracks me every time I see him, because he actually jumped in the air. He's doing this giant split in the air, and I know what's happening in his All pants right, when right. he's doing that. Because yeah. right after that, he came running off the stage, pulled the pants off. They had like 20 pairs of pants on the side of the stage just to keep him going. And then as soon as the show was over, they took him away in an ambulance. Was, but you were yeah. back there. He was laying there. They were giving him like intravenous and yeah. stuff. And you were letting you get photos of him, like. <laughs> no, up. that was a private moment. I didn't want to, you know, uh, I, I didn't want to embarrass him, and I, I didn't really want to inter interfere because it was serious medical emergency. I mean, you didn't know what was wrong with the guy, but he was really right. seriously hurt. Sometimes. But he's a professional. I couldn't believe it because he he kind of. It was the first time I went backstage with them where I was allowed in the dressing room and I remember going back in the roadies because they have a very professional operation Security's really and intense, in their dressing yeah. room there's no celebrities backstage there's no hangers on their own wives are like in another room you know the kids like the band is alone in the dressing room and uh, you know one of the the manager guys was escorting me back and the roadies were like you're going back in the dressing room like nobody does that you know and so I got in and the whole band was there and ready to take a picture it was 20 minutes before they're going on and Mike came out of the bathroom he goes I'm projectile vomiting I don't know what to do like he was sick as a dog and you can hear the audience going green day green right. day the biggest yeah. show they've done in yeah 60,000 yeah. people waiting and it was just you don't pull the plug like 10 minutes before the show you know well, that's what's so great about those guys so yeah they're professionals they play and play and play and they do a two or three hour show non-stop uh, they're, they're, they're the best band around today were you at that thing they did at Tower Records when they wrecked the whole place? With that oh, story? no. Uh -huh. That was a long time ago. I think they started writing on spray paint on the window. And oh, really? Going crazy, <laughs> yeah. I was like... In the well, the first time I became aware of them, actually, was I think they were on an MTV Awards or something. And they, they got some kind of award, did something, and then on the way off, Trey climbed up this giant like set. You know, uh, it was like a some big thing with poles on it and uh, maybe it was a big model of the award or something and he climbed all the way up to the top of it and they're trying to get him down and it's like very you know fragile the thing is like waving back and forth like you think it was going to fall over because it's only a set it's not meant to have all the weight of a person all the way in the top and they're jumping up and they couldn't climb up and get him and it was like during the show and so every time there's a wide shot you saw these people over on the side like jumping trying to grab you Trey and he's going. like up on top and he's dancing around up there and we're like who is that crazy guy you know right. but you know he's a he went to clown school to learn how to do it, you know. <laughs> it was pretty funny the first night we played with them, like we were opening for them in like uh, Denver, Denver, Colorado. We didn't know them, you know, we got on this mm. tour. I talked to Billy once, I was on tour with Social Distortion, and it's the first night, and we get out there, we don't know how their crowd's going to be to a bunch, bunch of fruits from New York, you know, we get out, and, and suddenly, you know, it was those days where the pits were going, the mosh pits, but it wasn't happening too much. And suddenly there's this little guy, and he's going crazy. And then people start going crazy. He was getting the pit started. He was the yeah. pit starter. I looked yeah. down, it was the drummer. It was Trey. Yeah. He just got it going oh, for Trey's us right weird. away. Like, when they played at the moshed second... Moshed our whole set, then played a set. When, you know? when they played at the second Woodstock, um, they played like the last day, I think, and people started throwing mud at him, and they started throwing it back. And everybody started getting covered in mud, and then Trey actually ended up off the stage in the mosh pit. 
And when he tried, to, and he broke his arm coming off the stage, and then trying to get back, he, he didn't have his pass because you know he had been on stage, and he's going, "I'm the drummer." He's going, "Like sure you are." He's all covered in mud; they couldn't recognize him. Broken arm. <laughs> he had a broken arm, and they're pushing him away. Yeah. But he's he's like very much in the moment. He's a real loose cannon. You, you have no, like idea. you never know what he's going to do. Oh, but he's a load of fun to hang out with. I'll tell you that. Cause he's, yeah, he's a. Laugh but they're good minute. people. Like they know how to have fun, but they're also like, like you know, they know. Yeah, they know how to have fun, but they know how to work, and they're very hard workers. You know, and they they don't let one interfere with the other. 